And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster who's res who's responsible for Magi Knights, the 5e-flavored take on Magical Girls and Super Sentai. Or just, sent or just Sentai, depending on who you ask. In the red corner, we, ha we, have, De we have Derek Salgi. And in the blue corner, we have Kira Salgi. Mm -hmm. How are you two doing tonight? Doing well. I'm vertical. <laughs> Did you say you're vertical? I am vertical. <laughs> just wanted to make just wanted to make sure I'm not going completely crazy. <laughs> I'm only I'm not crazy, I'm just dangerously sane. Mm. But I'd like to start I'd like to start at the humble beginnings in a sense. Um so both of you, could you walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made them stick? Uh, you want to take that first, or you want me to? Uh, sure. So I have two older <coughs> brothers who started playing D and D and BESM, and we also played the Sailor Moon role playing game. And they asked me if I wanted to join them. I didn't get super into them until after marrying Derek, when uh, he started GMing a lot, and uh, that was almost. It's been 13 and a half years, so that's how long I've been playing seriously. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a roundabout way to call Derek a forever GM. Yes, he is. I am the forever GM. Yeah, I've, I've been a forever GM since I was 16, basically. Uh, I was introduced to, you know, second edition through my dad. He was a big D&D guy growing up, mm -hmm. um, and he kind of was our DM as I grew up, and he was <laughs> one of those... Uh, kind of Gary Gygax, merciless DMs. Uh, you could almost expect a party wipe or escaping with the uh, by the skin of your teeth kind of moment every time. But it made those victories all the more sweet. So he didn't put you through Tomb of Horrors, did you? <clears throat> no, we didn't get that far. Um, I, I would, consider I yourself for consider yourself fortunate that you never had to run through that because that was that was an that was. Um, I like to call it Gary Gygax's middle finger. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard that, I've heard that. I've been interested in running it, but uh, I never had a chance to go through it myself. So, um, yeah. So you know, I would just played a lot of D and D at that age, and then at sixteen, I started DMing for my friends and tried a lot of different systems, but almost always returned back to uh, my D and D roots. So, mm -hmm. um, it is funny that you bring up um, BESM because. Well, hmm. Mc, uh, McKinnon has been on the show a few times. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, both for bi both for Big Eyes, Small Mouth when that came back, as well as some of the adjacent stuff, like the mini game trilogy, more recent, or or, or more recently, um, Absolute Power, which is a successor to Silver Age Sentinels. Okay. Um. Well, that that and that and um, anime Five E. Mm -hmm. Right, so right. He's a he's a he's a repeat he's a repeat guest here in the temple. Did you almost say repeat offender? <laughs> that is subject to interpretation. Well, if he has to visit a temple, then maybe he is. <laughs> it's time to confess my sins. <laughs> this is a temple, not a church. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Temples are for the holy ones. Well. You have you haven't seen it, but the avatar <coughs> I use for the temple is the Tuskang Temple in Tibet because I like the image of the of it being built into the side of a large hill. Ah, okay. Uh, you know this uh, this idea of it be it's more about it being a sanctuary than than about being for the holy people. Oh, okay. Sanctuary. Like so that. this is a safe place. We're in a safe zone right now. Is that what you're telling us? I do not consider I do not consider any any project that I do to be a to be a safe zone because I do not, 
I do I do not coddle. I am the person who pushes someone into the pool as their swimming lesson, and all I say is swim, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> How very monk like of you. <laughs> oh. Well, I gotta work my gimmick. But given now, given that and given the fact that you mentioned the the um sa the Sailor Moon RPG, which is mm -hmm. an, which is interesting because that's how I got that's how I got a lot of people into matters. Even if by the time I actually started using it, it had got it had gotten out of date. Mm hmm. Uh, because I did. I, w I was late to the party when it came to when it came to Sailor Moon. In fact, when I was at when I was tasked to DM a Sailor Moon campaign, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen much of the show past the Deke days. Um, oh yeah, so that's very different. <laughs> I um I ended up I ended up pulling I ended up pulling a Star Trek two and and just blitzing through the whole the whole series as preparation. Uh, How did that turn out for you? Um, well, I, it takes a certain type of constitution to go through 200 episodes in the span, <laughs> mm -hmm. in the span of uh, in the span of six weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I do it the same the same way you do, the same way you do any monumental task, one step at a time. Yeah. Um, and yes, that includes that includes that includes stars and much to my chagrin, because I'm a completionist, it also included the live action stuff. Oh wow! Oh wow! Okay, that's dedication. Mm -hmm. In every field, there must be an expert, <laughs> even if even if I have to suffer for my craft. But given that, but the thing I the thing I find interesting is you've just first off. Before we get into what I wanted to say on how you've described Magic Knights, how did the project come about? I think you might be able to answer that better than I can. Oh, so my daughter and I really wanted to play a magical TTRPG or magical girl TTRPG. And Derek always thought it would be fun to have one too. And so he kind of started writing one, but um, we just, me and my daughter liked it so much that Derek decided to make it into a full TTRPG that could be shared with other people and with a full world book and everything. So. Yeah, originally it was actually designed using the Genesis system uh, from Fantasy Flight Games. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. I am. All right, yeah. Um, I really... Yeah, I think coming from the mindset of a D20, D&D &D classical upbringing was really difficult for me to kind of grasp uh, Legend of Five Rings and Star Wars and Genesis itself. But at the same time, I could see the potential for storytelling through the dice narrative. And um, ultimately, when I was ready to very slowly open up playtesting, I realized that Genesis had a very small fan base. And so it was at that time... Um, and actually, I think we played once with Genesis, correct? Yeah, we did. And our daughter had a really difficult time making sense of the dice. And that's when it kind of hit me. We needed a more uh, understandable system with crunch, because I like crunch being, you know, from second edition upbringing. Um, and that's when I began to make the <laughs> long, arduous task of converting from Genesis to 5e. Yeah. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I, I'm not saying this is a boast, but I can guarantee you any any system that you that you may have run in the past, I've probably heard of it. <laughs> well, that's good. It shows you have a lot of knowledge. So, um, some some might argue too much. Too and much. I can, I can definitely see the Genesis DNA in in some bits of it, but oh, interesting! I I think you're the only person to have said that, but you may also be the only person I know of who uh, is even somewhat familiar with Genesis. So oh, if, that's interesting. If you go back, if you scroll back in the archives on on my channel, I did do a re a review of the three um start of the three Star Wars games, um. I have a I have a review of the of L five R fifth edition in my in my back pocket. I just need I just need the right time, right? Especially since 
Legend of the Five Rings is a game I have a very, very long history with. I, I saw a lot of the potential in it. Um, I was pretty late to the game. I never got into the, uh, the CCG. But after even reading just through uh, FFG's edition, I really enjoyed the lore, the, you know, the intrigue. Uh, we played the starter scenario, which we both, you know, really enjoyed. But um, yeah, I thought it was fun. It was just really hard to learn. <laughs> right. Um, I whenever whenever I he whenever I hear about about hard to learn, I al I always end up being reminded in the back of my head of how. Um, not no offense, but how good how good a lot of people nowadays have it. Oh yeah. Because, um, YouTube. <laughs> I that, that one of my one of my early experiences was Rifts, and hmm. Rifts has been my whipping boy for almost thirty years. What's Rifts like? I'm not familiar with it. Rifts uses the Palladium system, which okay. was a D100 based system. But it was busted. It, it it is, but the Palladium system is jank. <laughs> All it right. Is, it is very jank, and navigating it is a pain, and that's the reason why I don't go back. So very dissimilar from, say, Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu's ro call. The thing, the thing that I've the thing that I learned very quickly is that, <clears throat> um. Stating what sort of di what sort of die type a game uses um, doesn't t doesn't tell someone a whole lot. Um, just as a, just as an example, World of Darkness and Legend of the Five Rings um, up through Fourth Edition used D10 pools of dice. Okay, but that's where the similarities begin and end. Okay, all right. Um, and. When it comes and when it comes to Call of Cthulhu, just basic role playing has a interesting history with all the games that take that take notes from it, and all and all the th all the times it spun off or jumped between companies. Right, right. But yeah, I think that's a good observation. I mean, thinking about even the Death Watch Death Watch RPG from FFG also is it's a D hundred, but very dissimilar from you know COC. So I can see yeah. what you're saying. And well, when it came to Death Watch, that was one of I think I think five different takes on that system. Really interesting. I didn't know that. There were because there were multiple <clears throat> for, there were multiple forty k RPGs. Right, um, right. Dark Heresy, which was all about in, all about inquisitorial acolytes. Mm -hmm. yep. um, that one's fun. That was Rogue, a good one. Rogue Trader, which was about well, rogue traders. Um, Only War, which was focused on the Imperial Guard. Black Crusade, which was focused on um, the forces of chaos, right, and um, and of course Death Watch was focused on the um, the Death Watch the Death Watch division of the Space Marines. The the best one of the lot, saying best one. Mm hmm. That's what he thinks. <laughs> In this man's humble opinion, yes. Well, this is a free country, and you are free to be wrong. <clears throat> <laughs> what what would your vote be out of curiosity? What would my out, vote as far out of the ones you listed for forty k? As far, um, if I'm be if I'm being honest, I'll, I it's a it's a I'd say only war. Only okay, I might have to acquiesce that because I uh, early on tried to get a copy of that core rulebook and kind of struggled to to get a copy so. I was really interested in running the uh, IGs, but I'm sorry, Imperial Guardsmen, but um, I did not actually get to a chance to read that system or play through it. So I might very well acquiesce that. Yeah. Only war was when they decided to start going more freeform with their system. Okay. Instead, instead of the more instead of the strict career system they had been using. Ah, uh, okay. I can see the potential now. Then. Oh. But one thing I one thing I was curious about because you just because on some of the sales pitches for Magic Knights, you describe it as a as a magical girl and, and Sentai um, RPG, right? Yeah. But 
with a lot of the things I see, I see more. I see more of the former than the latter. How from how familiar are are you two when it came when it came to Sentai? So my familiarity mostly came with my upbringing of uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, mm-hmm. um, and then watching through, you know, Lost in Space or in Space rather, mm-hmm. and um, probably one of my favorite ones besides MMPR Samurai. But I do have to admit that a lot of my Sentai knowledge comes from the Power Ranger series. So. And it also comes from Persona, too, because that's Sentai, pretty much. Right, yeah. Uh, well, th- from, three, from, th- from three onward, po- possibly, I'd have a right. hard time arguing that with say, w- with, say, one or the twos. Yeah, I haven't played one or two, so... Well, the, I say the twos for for a reason because there's there's <clears throat> there's two um, there's two Persona twos. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I started with three. My sister introduced me to the series from three, so that's kind of where I started. That's how most people started, and those mm-hmm. the Persona games are are the kinder end of the Megami Tensei meta series. Right. Which is why I had, which is why I had a laugh when I saw people playing um, Shin Megami Tensei four on the D, on the DS back in the day, and and them acting surprised at how hard it was. Right, right. Well, welcome to Me- welcome to Mega Ten. You're gonna die. Mm. <laughs> but given given that some one thing that I one thing that was very apparent to me er, early on. Is the fact that despite this, despite this using five E framework, would mm-hmm. it be more? Would it be accurate to say that this is more like a five E hack instead of a campaign setting? Yeah, I think you might be justified in saying that. Okay. You know, it, it drew on a lot of different inspirations, and as you say, you know, what we mentioned rather earlier that it was originally a completely different system. Mm-hmm. So in that regards, yeah, you could justified in saying that it's kind of a hack instead and I, I think that'd be uh, very applicable the main the main reason that I say that is when you look at character creation while while things like abil- while things like ability scores and the like are are present the way the way classes are handled the way character relationships are handled the way backgrounds are handled isn't exactly this isn't exactly the same. Yeah, that that's actually true, and maybe I misinterpreted the OGL. But as far as I'm aware, you are not allowed to use um, Wizards uh, character creation process, and that was a huge hurdle for me uh, when we initially began designing and converting over. Because that's a huge part of the system is you know that chunk of character creation. So we had to come up with a unique. Um, identifying identifying way, you know, what what makes Magi Knights stand apart from just your regular 5e campaign setting. So um, because of that OGL limitation, we did kind of have to bounce around a lot of ideas. And mm-hmm. so and I, I'm pretty happy with it, though. Like what, when I looked at things like, say, the court cards of fate, which mm-hmm. um is some is something that is something that one would expect from some, from some of the more narrativist style, style games, something like Powered by the Apocalypse, right? Or or even or even something like Fate. As much as I pick on Fate at times, right? Um, and there is there is also the fact that as from unless I miss unless I miss something, the typical relationship between between class between um class with classes and subclasses is not present here. I think yeah, I think so. That, that might be true. A good observation. What do you think? Mm-hmm. I think yeah, and and especially in the sense that everybody's basically you know the closest thing you can relate a magi knight to is basically the eldritch knight. You're all um. Gish. You know, Gish, yeah, exactly. And that does stem from my uh, my second edition days. You know, my dad was like, well, what character do you want? You're gonna, you guys are going to start at level two. And I'm like, well, I want to be able to cast spells. And I want to wield a two-handed sword. And he's like, are you freaking kidding me? What are you, what are you thinking? You, 
that class is going to be terrible. So I played a, a Gish, a level one fighter sorcerer, and <laughs> I was pretty uh, unoptimized. But hey, out of out of my party of five, I was the only one who made it out <laughs> at the boss fight. And so I've I've talked with I've talked with another design design friend on the whole um, on the whole Gish thing, and it's it's something that. D that um D and D has never been able to get right. They still ha they still haven't been able to get it right. And in my not so humble opinion, the big reason why it why it hasn't been able to get it right is because of, is because of the limitations present with the Vancian model. Which that's yeah. the other thing I'm glad isn't present here because if you tried to do the Vancian model in this thing, it would die a quick death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think you're. You're spot on with that. Um, you know, with D and D, I also grew up playing Final Fantasy One and what is now uh, Four. So I took a lot of inspiration from that, and you know, I really wanted to bring that kind of old school fantasy feel, well, at least mechanically. And so, yeah, we went with mana points, and then kind of, you know, compared numbers on you know Fire, Fira, and Faraga. Went up from there with the mana point costs. Uh, we're still definitely balancing that, but uh, that's kind of yeah where we where I kind of saw that potential from. Yeah, and the the issue the issue that the issue that I often I often see when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the get when it comes to the gish thing is. The is the same pro the same problems that end up having happening with multiclassing. You're putting in extra effort to not suck. Right. Hmm. I haven't seen anybody sucking <laughs> in Magi Nights. <laughs> yeah, from our from our playtesting uh, with our few groups that we've had run through, I think everybody has felt like they've contributed in a meaningful way, and I think also. Uh, having social combat encounters really helps in, in the sense that it's not only, oh, I need to take my sword and hack this guy in two or disable him. It's, you know, I can use my persuasive abilities to influence my enemies to help them realize, you know, the wrongdoings, much like, you know, magic grills or even Power Rangers like to do and such. So I think I, I've never heard that critique so far, but we're always open and receptive to feedback. And something else I find kind of interesting is separating um, leveling with um, reputation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted this, this feeling that, you know, there is there are veterans of the group and, you know, you're fighting these very deadly enemies and there's a chance that um, one or maybe two or maybe even the majority of the group could die, but one person, the you know, the flag bearer would basically live on and everybody else would start over as these "Quote unquote new rice magi knights," mm -hmm. but the veteran would still be there helping them train, so they would have this kind of uh, increased ability through his uh, knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. And one other it, one other thing that I f that I find particularly in I find particularly interesting and this is where I really saw the um Genesis DNA is how is how you have magic work in the, yeah. in the sense that you're instead of instead of a set of pre and this is the other reason Vancian wouldn't work in this instead of having a pre-constructed um lit list of spells which another game that I've covered did mm -hmm. you have you have a um column A and column B kind of setup Yep, absolutely. That's heavily inspired from Genesis. Um, something I probably love the most about it. Uh, I, I know some people love the crunch of being like, oh, I have 100, 400 spells to look through and pick the best one. But uh, I found a lot when I was introducing new friends to even D&D 5th edition. They really struggled with you know picking spells. And they basically would, I, we would just tell them, oh, take cure, take you know, bless, take, you know, just generic spells, but then you decrease the amount of, I don't know, it, it that doesn't quite make the character feel like theirs, but if you just say, hey, these are your spells, you can choose, you're going to blast someone, you're going to make big explosions, 
you're going to, you know, do these different things. I think that's a lot easier to approach. And then people can flavor it how they like according to their character design. So really love that. So happy to have him here. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the other, th the other thing that I, that I couldn't help, that I couldn't help but notice within, within that, when, with, with how you mentioned that is that, that mage, that, that mage example, example that you gave that has 400 spells, Right. The counter that I always give is how many of those spells are you going to actually use in a campaign? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that there's too many, but so but so many of those spells are so situational and situational and redundant. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I did a bit. Or or in the wor or in the worst case, they're they are they end up stepping onto the toes of other of other archetypes. Um, Absolutely. A big example that I utilize and to to the point where I've effectively banned this spell unless uh, or unless it unless i have some caveats with it is knock knock really i was expecting the classic goodberry but knock okay let's hear this i have never liked the co knock or similar spells because i feel that they're stepping into stepping on the toes of other classes and the big problem with the mm -hmm. with a lot of casting classes in D and D and adjacent is you have is you have the ca it's not an issue of power per se. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people bring about bring about overpowered or underpowered. That's uh, that that's buzzing of flies as far as I'm concerned. It has more to do with a cert with a certain archetype getting more game out of the game. Right. There's this whole there's this whole app there's this whole avenue that they have access to that everybody else doesn't and it's made even worse when when part of that avenue steps onto other people's toes. I bring up knock because one one could easily ask the question, why do we why do we need to have a rogue in our party when the wizard can just cast knock and open up the door? Yeah, exactly. And that's actually my reasoning for my extreme dislike of Goodberry. Um, for survival, you know, uh, scenarios, much like the what was the winter one again? Um, ice. Yeah, the Icewind Dale campaign, yeah. whatever it was. But Goodberry basically knocks the survival portion completely out of the water. You just oh, I ate a berry one, and I'm good for the day. So, mm, no, thank you. And like, what's the ranger to do now? Well, the the ranger has been snake bit since day one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I liked my ranger. <laughs> well, it's speculated that because because of how, because of how rangers worked with a, worked with armor class back in the day, that's why the at death's door rule was implemented, so that rangers right. wouldn't keep wouldn't keep dying all the time. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how that uh, that kind of like concept of rangers always dying or rangers sucking uh, was even pervasive in like MMOs. Back in the '90s, like uh, EverQuest, Ever EverQuest had a ranger, and everybody was like, "No, nope, you're a ranger. You're a pariah. You don't get out of here. I don't want you on my team." So the well, one one of the big problems, just from a concept perspective, with the ranger is it's kind of hard to justify a class that relies on being outdoors when you're going to be in dungeons all the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's That's... the same. It's the same reason nobody likes nobody likes the guy who picks cavalier. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you're not bringing that horse into a dungeon, <laughs> mm -hmm. and without the horse, you're just a gimped version of a fighter. But unless the cavalier was a halfling riding a war dog, maybe I don't know. Bandage. <laughs> that is <laughs> that is a that is a ba that is that is like that is like stick that is like sticking a bit of a bit of scotch tape onto the problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, it just reminded me of uh, labyrinth. That's why I thought of it. So. Oh yeah. yeah, and I think the, when it comes to when it com the other problem is that the con the concept of the the concept of the ranger can just as easily be filled in a in a background as much as it, as much as a class. And right. For me personally, and I had argues with this with one of my colleagues. Um, I never I never understood the reasoning for for um rangers to be able to be casters. Right. In fact, it makes them worse because, once again, you have the question of why would I pick a ranger when I can do all that and more by picking a druid? Yeah, again, that's that true. whole 
that whole thing of ca of a certain archetype being too useful. Mm -hmm. It worked out for Minx quite nicely. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Back in second edition, it did anyway. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm no straight I'm no stranger to um to second edition, largely because my first my first foray was Beck me. So okay. Yeah, I have I've had an I've had an interesting um av avenue when it com when it comes to this. But part of the reason I, I found that I found that kind of thing interesting is I've always I've always liked the concept of di of dividing leveling instead of a universal leveling system. Right. Uh, and I think the the only game I can the only other game I can think of that ki that kind of has it that kind of the only there's okay I tell a lie there's two games I can think of that kind of dip into a dividing level divided leveling without going multi classing which is its own can of worms. Mm -hmm. Um one of them is the cipher system which is which is used in Numenera um the strange and a bu and a bunch of others including the upcoming old gods of Appalachia. Okay. Um because the because you get different benefits from your, from the three avenues to the character question and Westbound has has, takes the twenty level setup and div and divides it into four parts. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Not familiar with those, but that's interesting. Yeah. But when I, but when it comes and when it comes to social tact, when it comes to the whole social aspect, on one hand, I'm gl I'm glad I'm glad that that I'm glad that that's in. But on the other hand, I f I feel obliged to ask it ask. With so with the social end, I'm assuming it's more than just a skill check, which is what a lot of social ends end up being. Um, are you talking about like social points that you get with NPCs and other players? I'm more talking about how social encounters are handled, because in a lot of games, it ends up being a it ends up being a pass or fail style skill check, um, and the failure being a narrative stop was something that Gumshoe wanted to, uh, wanting to wanted to address and stuff like Trail of Cthulhu. Oh, so you're talking about like persuasion checks and things like that. Um, usually there's uh, partial su successes. Mm. Um, well, Derek could explain this better, but yeah, so. Um, if it is like a one-off check, we we don't like the you know thought of oh pass or fail. It's you know degrees of success, um, which is also kind of you know a very Genesis kind of thought process. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you succeed, but you're, it's going to come at a cost. Or maybe they agree to your plan, but later on you know it, they might sell you out or something like that. Um, for combat, we we allow people to make like a convincing argument and if they succeed on like their skill check then they get to deal a d12 plus their modifier to that damage to their conscience hit points um but also some um creatures or individuals rather are resistant to different types of arguments so like we have of course you can use almost any stat with your persuasion are you making an intellectual argument pointing out the flaws in their logic are you being charismatic are you trying to like reach them through you know sincerity so that would be you know your charisma and they can have resistances to that maybe they're hardened to you know sincere pleadings but hey they, they're very open to hearing the flaws of their logic and being talked out of their you know plots through that aspect so that's one way we do it Now, within within the material that that you that you guys had, I had noticed that you that you had mentioned inspiration points being used differently than than the usual approach, which I'm perfectly fine with because I always found inspiration to be a bit undercooked. So, how do you how do you guys use inspiration? Um, there, it's used for your student abilities, which are used in any social encounter. So like the charming student has an ability that allows them, anytime they make a charisma skill check, 
um, they can automatically get a 20 for their roll. Um, and they use their inspiration point to activate that ability. And each student has their own. And then what are the other uses? Yeah, so we have like each student ability has their own, you know, thing that they're good at, depending on whether they're uh, the charming student or the, you know, the int intellectual. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, we have combat formations once you get to a certain level. And if you guys fail your leadership checks, you can use inspirations to maintain that cohesive formation until you um, kind of gain more skills, like, uh, not skills, better social bonds with each other so that you're better able to react to your friends. You guys know how each other think and fight. And um, the, of course, the traditional re-rolling and uh, literal inspiration, which I think a lot of people are familiar with you use the inspiration to get a like a big clue mm -hmm. to some sort of mystery um, from your herald, the DM NPC that helps you out. So uh, yeah, there, there's quite a few ways to, you know, use inspiration and to regain it in our system. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of the times it's not, not a lot, but I would say it's not given out with DM fiat. It's uh, you get it from having a really easy day at school or becoming a student of the hour, listening to really juicy gossip. Um, but the, the GM can give it out too. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. If he, if he feels that you really did something momentous, he should absolutely give that person an inspiration she. point. He or she. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I will admit when I looked at these student types, one thing that I get, one thing that I end up being reminded of is and this and this is a bit this is a bit of appropriate timing given what's coming later this month d20 modern was that something that you had di that you had dipped into in the past no not at all um i was curious about it but i didn't even have a chance to like look at the system or anything like that um you know a lot of the influences like we said came from genesis uh a lot of the kind of Squadron formations came from Death Watch formations. Mm -hmm. um, the magic system, you know, we came, also came from Genesis. The social point system, a lot of people uh, feel that there's a lot of connection to Persona there. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I think m the most influence I had on, on me for that was actually the Fire Emblem series. Um, going through the school aspects and making your friends and increasing their affection levels um, was kind of my main influencer there but definitely persona because i'm a persona guy i like it so. oh thank god you never you never try and play through thracia 776 when it comes to fire emblem i haven't played that one <laughs> that oh, obviously you shouldn't <laughs> that's on the that's on the short list of game of fire emblem games that still haven't gotten an official translation a few months back it got a fan translation and thracia is infamous for being one of the harder of one of the harder um, Fire Emblem games of those early days. Mm. Yeah, I can take a lot of punishment, but I mean, if if you kill off one of my favorite characters, I'm just going to reload and do the battle ten times until I get it right. So, mm -hmm. uh, that I, Fire Emblem. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a little bit biased when it com when it comes to difficulty in games because I um. I had cut. I had cut my teeth on. I had cut my teeth on stuff like the Plutonia experiment with Doom. Right, right. I.e., what? I.e., the Mario and Dario, Mario and Dario Casali saying, "Oh, you got. You guys think that you're good at. You guys think that you're good at Doom to go to breathe through on ultraviolence. Okay, <laughs> here's yeah. Plutonia. Have fu have fun dying by getting shot to death by reviving chain gunners. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I love difficult games. I think the issue with Fire Emblem is losing uh, characters that you've kind of attached to, that you've formed bonds with, and you just can't bear to see them, you know, pass on. If it was just like a named character with no backstory or any affection points, I think that'd be one thing. You could replace them and move on. But Fire Emblem does a great job, you know, uh, getting you attached to those characters and making you care about them, making sure that, yeah, the fact that you did one shot my mage means I'm going to start this. 25 round battle all over again so i think that's i think that's why i, re I remember a lot of people using the fact that 
um, Valk a game like Valkyria Chronicles gives you multiple chances to at least rescue down mm -hmm. characters. Yeah, as that, a, that is as a nice a, touch as a um, a selling point. And I'm not saying I'm not saying one's I'm not saying one's better than the other. Just di just different. Even I though, do love um, the setting. Even though um, Radiant, even though I have a bit of a grudge against um, Radiant Dawn when it comes to Fire Emblem. Right. <laughs> right. Mostly because I'm fine with difficulty, but there's a line between difficulty and evil. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and now, give, given given the subject matter that we're dealing with, whether it be it mag be it magical girl or Sentai, there's always the emphasis on teamwork, and I'm guessing a lot of that is handled through the Unity system. Yeah, yeah, and actually, we so as a DM, I was always frustrated. I love rolling for stats. I, I, that's just the way I grew up on, but it became very quickly apparent that you would have someone who would roll extremely well and unanimously everyone would get annoyed with that character as they would still the limelight and you would be forced to kind of almost adjust certain you know combat encounters to account for this 18 20 strength 18 20 constitution and 20 you know these insane stats while everyone else is just pretty average characters and so we wanted to start from step one this is team game and so you roll, you know, as classic, but you generate your stats together um, using uh, what we call observing fate's influence. And so we made it like kind of like a little mini game and everybody has, you know, the same stats that they're able to move around and slightly, slightly manipulate, but ultimately they're all going to have the same uh, point total. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> And tell about the Unity system, though. Yeah, and the Unity system, um, that is another uh, really big Im impact was, you know, thinking back on all of these really cool combo moves that uh, Sentais do and Magical Corals do together. So as they level up, they, you know, they create these combination maneuvers. And if they have Unity points, they can um, basically do, you know, we have physical damage, magical damage, and then true damage. And the spectral outsiders, our big, bad, tough monsters, always have a resistance to either magical or physical. But combos always do true damage. So because of their combination of these powers, they're always able to bypass these resistances and have some really cool special effect that no other Magi abilities can replicate. So um, yeah, and then the social bonds uh, between them they gain special abilities just from growing close to one another and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, in within that, one of the one of the th one, within the spell system, one of the things I wanted I was curious about is the concept of um, spell path, especially mm -hmm. when you look at the character sheet and you see multiple tiers of it. Um, is is it a case where as you're leveling up you're going to get mul your the multiple tiers of it are is it just going to be um increasing the scale of the, of the same spell or it or are there go are there going to be other avenues of customization within higher t within higher tiers yeah so we wanted to keep a uh, spell pass a little more simple and streamlined um and they kind of alternate so for instance if you look at uh beam being the first level is just very direct, 46, you know, blast damage. However, the second one allows you to make two attacks at, you know, kind of like Scorching Ray. Uh, you pick two different targets, so it has a dual special ability. And then it, Beam is just extremely straightforward. Um, explosion, which hits what we call hordes, uh, which are groups of larger enemies. Um, it can hit one target or all parts of a horde. And so the first one just does intensity, which means all rolled ones become threes. And then the second one does converge, which is when you attack a single target, it actually increases the damage beyond its normal listed value. And then it kind of alternates. And then the final version has both. Um, but after those uh, kind of basic damaging spells, they do kind of get really different uh for instance look at transformation 
So we have the transformation path, which allows you kind of was a similar reskin to um, Shilly Law. And that's how it starts out at one, but at two, it lets you, you know, basically an empowered Shilly Law. And then at three, you get this kind of Dragon Ball Z slash Sailor Moon slash Power Ranger, like enhanced transformation. Mm-hmm. And so instead of summoning a Instead of summoning an animal, which is kind of my initial thoughts, which can kind of bog down gameplay and adds extra things to track, I just thought, what if you just get a bunch of temp HP, you move faster, and you gain an additional action on your turn? So that's kind of where we were heading with that. And then those kind of just keep getting stronger and more powerful the higher tier you get. So, Because mm-hmm. something, that, something that can potentially happen Something that can potentially happen within within um, casting is mm-hmm. what I like to call the Nova problem. Yeah. Um, Novaing or go or going Nova is when players um, hold off on a lot of their powerful stuff and then um, just dump everything on the B bag of a campaign. Yeah, and that's actually the way. That's actually the way. Uh, those shows work if you think about it you know it's the they kind of fight off a few little goons and then they fight the you know the B, bbg and then they go nova and that's kind of what we were going for actually in a sense um so we when we design our encounters we expect your party to be either full power or fully prepared um or you know everybody's going to throw everything they have at this creature and maybe they will be victorious or maybe not um so that's kind of actually our design point is we want the characters to go Nova and uh, later on when we design some of the higher level scenarios, we do want to kind of draw it out instead of one big encounter. It'll be one smaller encounter, another small encounter, and then, you know, maybe the bad guy. So uh, that is our design plan actually is to build around going Nova. Cause uh, I personally noticed my players love to go Nova. And then as soon as they're like, Oh, I'm, I'm hurt, or, oh, my man is so low. Guys, can we just rest? And they'll figure out any way they can to just say, oh, it, it's nap time. Everybody make camp. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's time to rest up. So um, so we, we built around that. And then also the fact that we broke our game into phases, which is the sleep phase, and, the you know, preceding that is the patrol phase. And it's like, no, you you can't go to sleep until it's time to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have an a actual life with a schedule. So, uh, I think that'll help with that a lot too. Mm-hmm. Um, now, something something else I was um, I was curious about is the notion of combat forms, because yeah. the way that I'm, the way that I'm looking at it would it be fair would it be fair of me to say that it's akin to a stance or even akin to the fighting style that that certain classes in Five E have. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a few unique ones. Um, for instance, like Purgation, Form 4, mm-hmm. uh, which as a bonus action while wielding a two-handed melee weapon, you deal your strength modifier times reputation level each part of an adjacent enemy horde. Yeah. And we basically just kind of think, yeah, there's so many guys around you, you don't even need to roll. You're just going to swing your sword, you're going to hit a bunch of dudes, and then that's your cool bonus action. Um, and, you know, so the concept of hordes is unique to Magi Knights. So, but there are definitely some very, very familiar ones, you know, plus one to your weapon attack, plus one to armor. So, yeah. By all accounts, it was nothing more than a hulking mass of iron. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I do, I, I get the feeling that this is something, that this is something you might have to, you might have to have brought up to playtesters. Mm-hmm. From the way, I inter- from my interpretation of it, um, the combat forms, even though they're listed with Roman numerals, you don't have to necessarily get them in order. Oh no, absolutely not. Um, we've actually never had anybody ask yeah, that. Yeah, we've yeah we've never had anyone ask that. Um, honestly, I put them in Roman numeral order because a I like the way Roman numerals look, and I it slightly reminded me of Knights of the Old Republic with the different forms you could adjust and change your character to. So. Well, that that's something that was just, that's just with lightsaber forms, period. And a lot of 
Right. A lot of the um a lot of the a lot of the lightsaber forms that are known um weren't e- weren't even refined yet by the by the events of the old republic games. Okay, well there you have it. Um cuz a lot of the, if you if you were to look at the se- the seven forms, you have a case of the, of them being reactions to uh, to either other forms or other um form other forms of combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's and that's not too far removed from how well that any sort of development is going is going to work. If um it's always it's always on a reaction basis. Right. And I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that for those who for those who end up developing multiple forms, which is probably going to be inevitable, it's not it's not that hard to switch between them. Yeah, no. Uh, if you take like a we have tactics, um, and if you take the combat tactic that allows you to take additional um, forms, you know you you do combat form drills, and then it, you can as a free action once per turn switch between these different forms. And then um, eventually you can do combat form mastery, which actually increases the benefits of each form, so that you're very versatile. Yeah. Now, getting back to getting back to spells, I did. I know that I know that um, your ch- your choice of magic knight is going to determine what spell paths are available to you. But how much of a factor does element play in the type of spell casting that you can do? Um, how sure. much does yeah. elemental affinity play? Um, so the element actually doesn't affect what spells you can get. Uh, it's more so for role playing and flavor in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can name your spells based on your element or uh, whatever your magi knight believes in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also what it looks like the way you describe it usually is based on your element too. Yeah, so you initially, there's four types of magic in our world. Uh, ethereal, or mysticizing, soul, or manifesting. And they have alternate names, shaper, shaping, and verse, or versing. And, you know, those four types of magic allow you to pick, you know, out of your list of five potential spells, you start with two, or spell paths, you start with two of those paths. And so um, those choices are completely flavored. So they don't have any, beyond letting you choose which uh, spell paths you have access to, they don't have any, you know, interlocking preventative yeah. choices. Um, in that regard, I think I think it's also important to go over the concept of, of branching elements. Mm-hmm. Um, and how, how, does, how would that factor into the relationship between that and, and elemental affinity? Um, so we mostly put those in there because there are a lot of people that said, like play testers that said like, oh, I want to use lightning. And, um, we didn't want people to feel too, uh, constricted. Yeah. Constricted by only choosing those four elements. Cause they're mostly there as flavoring, like we said. So, um, we just picked elements that were similar that could fit into the, each category and gave them branching elements. And then um, it mostly plays into how you describe your spells and your attack. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, early on, early on, it's mentioned that, that, um, that about a story arc going from what, going from one to 15. Are you, are you capping level advancement at 15? Or are you going all the way to twenty in the full book? No, I think fifteen is a good bet. Um, you know, there's a lot of research done from wizards that shows not a lot of um, play groups make it all the way to twenty. And honestly, they have shown that as uh, players and classes gain higher levels, it becomes more and more difficult to balance around. And so, I think the simple solution to that would just be to reduce the total level. So that's kind of what we did. Um, but we did um, build our system around that milestone experience. And so it's if it's a short scenario, you gain one level from completing it. 
And if it's a longer one, you would gain one in the middle and one at the end. So. Mm -hmm. um, I actually did have a did have a discussion with a designer friend of mine on that on the issue, and oh, interesting. I do I um I do think I do think that there's that there's some there's some factors that a lot that a lot of people overlook because. I often I do often hear that or that or that it becomes or that leveling becomes boring at past tenth, but mm. I never hear people go into why beyond beyond some vagaries. So I just so I decided I need to do some deeper digging because I can't leave well enough alone. <laughs> right, right. Oh, uh, and that's that's something that I'm working with. But I shouldn't I should note when it comes to my own history I um. One of my er one of my early excur excursions into into doing actual plays, and I don't recommend anyone listen to it because it's absolute it's a it was absolutely horrible. But <laughs> years ago, I ran a common writer themed campaign using a game called oh. Writer the Transformation. Cool. Okay. Um, which trying to get that system to work for for a game for a game that was ostensibly about that was ostensibly themed around common writer was a royal pain. <laughs> yeah. Especially since I had to cre one of the one of the characters wanted ut wanted utility forms and I had and there was nothing that supported utility forms in that book. I had to make that from scratch. Wow. Um it was bro it was broken as all hell but I d but I was able to eventually pull it off. Nice. But the question that I have for you um, putting putting aside the whole utility form thing because that's that's a that would be that's going to be a tricky subject matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could could a game like could a game like Magi Knights um, support a common writer themed campaign? <laughs> it's so funny you ask that. We've had so many people ask for that. Mm -hmm. So you should explain it, Derek, because you're the one who made the character. Yeah, so we actually have had, a, like she was saying, a lot of uh, people join the server that are really interested in Common Rider, and you know that's definitely a, uh, you know, part of that Sentai group we really want to cater to. And so we've been listening to a lot of feedback and uh, things that they want to see in the game, and uh, initially, I just did the best I could based off what little I know and kind of what I've been watching from common writer, trying to, you know, make myself aware and more knowledgeable of it. But, uh, I created a pretty respectable character, common writer character for level one. And I kind of reskinned, uh, let's see, like the GM's Herald. I said, you know, if it was going to be a full common writer team, I said, Oh yeah, the GM's Herald could be like a vehicle. And it, that, your soul crystal has a constant connection to, and then your court card of fate could even be a motorcycle or a car uh, that whatever prize possession that helps you in combat. Um, I reskinned the vehicle as a squire damsel, as you're probably taking care of the vehicle a lot. And you could even do something like old school kit from Knight Rider, where if it can offer you assistance, then maybe it's more of a knight or a dame. We reskinned. Um, like the beam direct damage to be like Taya Kokan, Midnight Shadow, and you could fling like shurikens, and your explosion damage would be you flying through the air, hitting a bunch of people, and then returning to your previous position, mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. But uh, we actually had a uh, common writer sailor in our uh, Discord also give his own kind of interpretation, which I think is obviously he's a big fan, so this is going to be even more true to. Common writer, so his looks fantastic. So I recommend, you know, coming into the server if you guys are interested in that and checking out um, other people's uh, kind of character designs and yeah. peeing ideas and giving us more feedback on how we can get a yeah. Reality. I I was I was gonna ask how 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 this could be done with Garo, but I didn't I didn't ask that because I figured it out pretty easily. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, largely because you would. Doing something like Garo, you wouldn't have to change all that much. Mm -hmm. um, you might have you might have to reflavor a few a few things and po and possibly put in something to reflect the um, time limit with the ar with the armors. I'm not sure if I'm not sure how you, how familiar either of you are with um, Garo, but 
the but transformations with Makai Knights in that series has a t as a time limit. Okay, oh. interesting. That the armor can only be maintained for ninety nine point nine seconds. Oh, you can wow. maintain it longer than that, but you run the risk of becoming what's known as a lost beast. Wow, that's a cool idea. Yeah, and this is the kind of stuff that I would really be interested to see. Um, you know, other players kind of add on to our system to be like, well, hey, I'm going to add on some, you know, extra rules to throw out for all my friends to make cool things like this. So yeah, that's something we'd love to see. Yeah, and I and I can I can certainly see that now. I know, th I know that you said that you're launching in May, with the with in the cringiest way possible with that meme. <laughs> yes. Which of you do I have to blame for that? Me. <laughs> well, kind of both of us, but more so me, because I loved in sync when I was in early middle school. I think. So you're inflicting it upon the rest of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's so it's you. All, so it's you. I have, I'll have to send the therapy bill to. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I go through. I go through cursed firearms. You're gonna have to do more than that to make me cringe. Ooh. <laughs> uh, but what are you guys shooting for as far as the launch date for the Kickstarter and poss and possibly the um, release window later on? Um. So the launch date is a week from today, the 17th of May. All right. And release date. We're planning on July of 2023 when it will actually be delivered because since our budget is small right now, we need to give the artists enough time to make all the artwork. And we're hoping to have a lot in the book, um, provided that we have the funds to do so. So a lot of our artists have said that they need a month per character and we're going to find as many as we can to get as much in the book as we can, but it still will require time. And then also we're finishing balancing the higher level um, content. So we need time for that as well. And then of course, all the formatting and printing and shipping time, which is like six months by itself. So. Yeah. We initially talked about maybe pushing it to be sooner, but uh, we kind of realized that this is a, our love letter to Magical Girls and Sentai. And we really wanted to make sure that there was uh, an abundance of provided funding, mm. but um, beautiful things to, you know, complement all of our mechanics in the book. And even, you know, you have those RPG books where sometimes it's not just a system, it's, it's this work of art. And we really wanted to capture that. Look so at you, the Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we really hope that we can meet that goal and reach those stretches. And honestly, it just gives us more time to get more feedback and more, uh, you know, play testing from our, from our supporters to give, deliver the game that they want to see and that everybody can appreciate. Yeah, we're always open to players giving their input. And we've actually added in a lot of things because of play testers' suggestions. So... Uh, we would love more people to have the time to give that to us before release. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how this develops and and how it shakes out when it finally enters the halls of my temple. <laughs> yeah. And I and I look for and in the in and in in lieu of not of not jinxing you guys. There we go. Um, <laughs> I have to use something audible because you wouldn't know if I was tossing salt over my shoulder or something like that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Remember, folks, only to only use a sprinkle of it, not the whole can. Yeah, really. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thanks for having us too. It was really fun. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been an amazing experience. So we really appreciate you. And uh, we hope you keep your soul crystal close, but your squad mates closer. <laughs> uh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>